Welcome back to Worth the Effort Wordworking and our Turning Basics series. This is going to be the second class in the series, and I'm going to discuss a lot of the, I want to say, ancillary tools or accessory tools you're going to want to get with your lathe, and then we're finally going to start making a mess with this thing. Now, a quick review. In the first class of the series, I basically unboxed a brand new MIDI lathe, and that was kind of a prompt so I could discuss all the different parts that come with the lathe, their purposes, how to tune them up, that kind of stuff. I also broke out and told you some uh, accessories that I think you ought to get right from the get-go, simply because they'll open up a lot more options for you to go progress in this craft. Specifically, I talked about getting a good chuck, a variation of the live center or drive centers that came with the thing, a Jacob's chuck, and a nice luxury accessory would be an aftermarket tool rest. Then for your homework, I asked you to watch a four cuts video I did. And that basically described how the edges we use interact with the grain and why we use certain tools for certain things. In that video, I went in depth starting with the skew, which is, in my opinion is a basis for all the other tools. We also discussed the spindle gouge, the bowl gouge, the spindle roughing gouge. We talked about some scrapers, and that was about it. <laughs> I covered pretty much all the cuts, a, sl a slicing, a planing, a peeling, and a scraping cut. Now, there are a couple of accessories that you're going to see me, uh, other, gouge tool, other tools and gouges that I'm going to use in this series. Specifically, I'm going to use a parting tool, and this is just a cheap, inexpensive one. I also have a variation, a very thin parting tool I use very rarely. You're going to want some kind of awl. You can use a nail. That would be fine. Then for my uh, scrapers, I have a burnishing tool. And this is something we will probably make in this series. It's just a little drill bit with a handle. It just makes hollowing a lot easier. And obviously, some sandpaper. And a nice thing you're going to find that you end up using more often than not is a mallet. And you don't need a fancy mallet. This is the ones I make. This is the one my dad makes. And because this is something that's nice to have, it's one of the things we're going to be making in today's video. Oh, and one other tool I use quite a bit is a little hand saw. This is a flush cutting saw that I had my hand tool woodworking in. I just find it's, it's really nice to have. And you can buy something like this at any big box store fairly inexpensively. Now price wise, I've always said that wood turning is one of the least expensive forms of woodworking there is. The problem is most of your expense is up front. You know, I can teach somebody to do hand tool woodworking you know, 150, 200 bucks worth of used tools, and you've got something that you could pretty much build everything you need in your house. The difference is with hand tool woodworking, you buy the wood. So you, most of your expense is in the material. Well, with wood turning, you know, if you're buying new, like I've shown you that I, I do a lot, do here, you know, you're just talking, you know, $700. Some of these gouges are 40 to $70, that kind of stuff. And that's a lot of money. Uh, if you go used, obviously you'll save quite a bit, but still all the capital is up front. The difference being the wood can be free. I mean, just firewood anywhere or just harvest a tree or something like that. So you can do this hobby very inexpensively once you get going. And compared to other branches of woodworking, you don't need a lot of tools. I mean, hand tool woodworking, you got little tools everywhere that are doing everything. A basic set of tools, and you can do most everything here. Also, yeah, it, you know, your great granddad and stuff like that, if you've had tools passed down a lot of times, a lot of times those are, uh, those are carbon steel tools, especially if they did lower speed, trundlelays, that kind of stuff. And the tools look quite a bit differently than they did 50, 60 years, because most of us are using power turning, turning things right now instead of a, a spring pole or a treadle lathe or something like that. Also, steel technology has come a long, long ways. Now, there is high-speed steel, 
and then there is high-speed steel. And different manufacturers use different levels of steel. Now, some of the tools I first started out with, you know, I just bought at some of the woodworking stores. This is a Robert Sorby style. And honestly, for a spindle roughing gouge, I don't think I would ever need more. I have desi desires for a larger one. And if I get a larger one, I will probably invest in a better steel. But even this cheapest of the cheap ones, that's a lifetime investment for me. I've been using this for 15 years now. I've probably only worn away that much of the steel. Whereas other tools like my spindle gouge, I'll go through this probably once a year. Just that's how much I use it in my production work. So whenever I upgraded my tools from an original, I want to say the original spindle gouge I got was a, um, a Wood River one or something like that. I've been upgrading to Thompson tool steel because I like the steel. I like the characteristics of how long it takes to sharpen. I like the characteristics of how long it takes holds an edge. And I like the characteristics of how the edge fails. But until you've practiced a little bit and you've ground away a whole bunch of steel as you've learning to sharpen, maybe that's not an investment you want to do. Plus the fact that if you just go buy a inexpensive one, it's probably going to come with a hand or stuff like that. Whereas the more higher up you go, you know, you might spend the same amount for this as you did this, but with this one right here, all you're getting the blade. You have to make all the handle and stuff like that. But as you can see in my daily collection, I have everything from, I'm not even sure what brand this is. I know it is the cheapest of the cheap, you know, it's, it's not even in the handle straight, all that kind of stuff, but it served my needs fairly well. Then as I've upgraded some tools, uh, I, I tend to go with the Thompson's tool steel, but this right here was just a piece of metal stock, square metal stock that I made it out of. Uh, they were selling these for, I think, $5 a stick at one of the trade shows I went to. Uh, I had pinnacle steel for my bowl gouge. I have yet to wear this one out, so keep using it until it does pretty well, and I've been pretty happy with that steel. So do your research on the quality of the steel. Put a priority on the steel and not the handle, but when you're first starting out, maybe the luxury of already having a handle on it is worth it. So now that we've covered the lathe and the cutting tools we use at the lathe, let's talk about a lot of the ancillary tools that kind of go with this. Uh, just like the table saw needs a jointer and a planer to work kind of in a shop, the lathe requires other tools, power tools that just make its life a lot easier. Let's start with safety. Now, I don't know what it is about turning but it brings out more safety police and horror stories than any niche of woodworking I know. Now, there is a fact uh, that I've repeated over the years and I forgot why I got it. But more people in the woodworking realm dealing with power tools get injured on bandsaws. And that kind of makes sense to me because bandsaws are used in a lot more crafts other than woodworking. I mean, even in meat processing, they use bandsaws. More people get maimed, meaning things get chopped off on table saws in our craft. But more people die using a lathe. And that's kind of considerable since there aren't as many lathes out there. But there is some common sense aspect to safety in the woodworking realm that can really prevent you from a lot of the dangerous stuff. And I don't know if it's that lack of common sense out there that drives a lot of the comments that you see on every one of my turning videos. You will see some person going, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be promoting that because, uh, you know, somebody might do it and they will die at that. Or another comment, you know, my niece's uncle's non-blood relative, blah, 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 friend of a friend, you know, they were turning once and that thing flew off and hit them in the head and they weren't right ever since. I mean, some kind of horror story always comes out in the comments section. So, let's break this down a little bit. Newton has taught us that force equals mass 
times acceleration, meaning the potential damage a piece of wood can have on you depends upon how big it is and how fast it's moving. So the danger, the risk of something like this or this or this or this or this or this, or this or this. It's going to be different because each one of those had a different amount of mass. Then there are facts of how fast those things are moving. Because I could take this right here and throw it as hard as I possibly could at you. You ain't going to get hurt. In fact, I could probably take this right here and do the same thing and it might break your skin and might leave a blue bruise. I mean, I could tell you a baseball probably weighs three times as much and we re routinely throw baseballs at each other at 70, 80, 90 miles an hour when you're hitting. And how many times have you seen a baseball player get hit with it? And look at the helmets those baseball players are using. They really are just a piece of plastic. But something like this right here, it doesn't matter how gently I set it down on top of you. You're gonna die. In fact, in the Middle Ages, I think that was some kind of form of torture and execution they called pressing. Didn't want to be a witch back in the Middle Ages. I bring this up because the PPE, the protective stuff we buy in this craft is not designed really for blunt force trauma. And that's the warning, the comments, the safety police. That's what they're mainly concerned about. It's proper techniques, which you're going to learn here, that's designed to avoid blunt force trauma. Because another one of Newton's laws was something in motion tends to stay in motion. So here's the thing. If you're working on something that theoretically doesn't have enough power to really damage you, it's safe to work in the line of fire because it's rotating here. This is the direction of motion. Whereas if you are turning something that could potentially hit you, the techniques you learn, the techniques you teach, the techniques that work keep you outside of the line of fire. We ain't working here if we're turning a 45 pound unbalanced piece of hunk of wood, okay? It just isn't that safe. But if you've got it balanced, you've got it perfectly shaped, it is spinning smoothly, evenly, the thing isn't vibrating, you know, you're still working in the safe zone, but every now and then you might bring your hand a little bit over into the danger zone. It's a calculated risk, but none of that is protection that you can buy. It's only protection you learn. What you can buy is stuff that's going to keep shavings out of your eyeballs. As I said, um, you know, when I turn, I, you'll never see me turn without something protecting my eyes. And normally it's going to be these plastic glasses. And yes, they are not the best out there because they don't have any side protection. But in all my years of turning wearing these very glasses, I've never gotten a little shaving in my eye while turning. How do I get shavings in my eye? I do this occasionally. And I sh physically shove it into my eye because I'm stupid sometimes. Same with everybody else. Now even the cheapest eye protection you can get, a lot of times that comes with the lathe, you know, they have that wraparound feature as a safety aspect. Other things is you want to protect your lungs. Oh, a lot of people will recommend shit face shields, and I do wear face shields for the beginning portion of bowl turning and shaping and stuff like that, because a lot of the techniques I do has shavings flying straight at my face, and this just kind of deflects it out off the side. Oh, I will say, you get turning quite a bit, your reflexes go to pot. You know, something starts flying at your face, well, a turner, we get so used to that kind of stuff, it doesn't react, so you got to be careful of that. It's a learned response that could put you in danger if, you know, your cat flings a piece of kibble at you. But this 
is not going to protect you from a 45 pound bowling, unbalanced bowling ball. That's the kind of stuff that protects your eyes. The other major thing you need to protect is actually your lungs. And I really do like turning with a fan to my back. A lot of times you don't see that on camera for the simple reason it obstructs the noise. But just having a light fan, blow, fan blowing air this way for the sawdust that comes off while you are turning. We're not talking about when you're sanding, but just the little stuff that comes off while you're turning. It's just kind of nice to have it blown this way. Now, when you're sanding, you really do need some kind of dust collection. It could be something as simple as a shop back where the hose is right there sucking most of it in. That works incredibly well. Even better if you can have a dust collector, which it deals more in the volume of air than the pressure of air of a shop vac. And that, that really takes care of a lot of the stuff. Yes, you might want to wear a mask or a respirator or something like that. And there are some shields, if you have the money, that will fit around your face. And they have a little motor or something like that, either attached to the helmet or to a little backpack with a hose that puts positive air pressure in here that just keeps blowing stuff out and only filtered air mixed into it. If you buy one of those, get the ones with the backpack because having all that weight in the helmet, is it'll give you a headache after a while. Those are an incredible luxury and something you would use in a lot of other stuff. Uh, for example, painting cars or anything like that. But they're a bit of luxury outside my reach right now. Now, we don't have our dust collecting set up in this shop yet. And in my old shop, I had that rolling thing around here. But when we moved here as a temporary setup, one of these little dust collectors you can buy, a lot of different people make different quality levels of them, and a flexible hose. And a lot of times, I'll just duct tape this to a broom on a stool and set it over next to my lathe, and it just works just fine. Set that right next to the lathe. You can flip it on and off whenever you need to so you don't take up much space in your garage. And as a turner, you don't need all those hoses and stuff like that or even a very expensive dust collecting setup because your mess stays pretty, pretty centralized. And that really is about it as far as PPE that you normally see out there. Stuff to protect your eyes, stuff to protect your lungs. Now, controversially, I advocate gloves in some situations, especially when you're roughing out bowls or stuff like that. For the simple reason, wet bowls have a lot of water, and when you're cutting with a tool, a lot of times it generates friction that turns that water into steam, and your hands are really close to that steam. So the gloves actually protect me not from the shavings coming off hitting my hands, but the heat. You can get burns on that. Now, wearing gloves in a video will always get you comments that you shouldn't wear gloves around power tools. And there are techniques of holding your tools up underneath so that those shavings won't be touching your hand and you won't be burned. But these kind of techniques where you're using your finger grips and pressing down this way over a eight hour day will wear you out. Imagine rock climbing holding onto your fingertips for eight hours straight hours. That's why there is the overhand technique where you can just rest your hand to keep that pressure in, but that puts your hand in line of fire of the shavings, the steam, the hot water. So a glove just makes sense. Now obviously I use fingerless gloves so that there's less to catch. I have very tight fitting stuff and when they wear out or the things get ragged around them, I collect them. The other thing is, if you ever notice, when people who are turning are wearing gloves, they are using proper learned techniques where their hands are always behind the tool rest. So if the wood's spinning here, very like, less likely for it to get caught. It's learned technique to counteract any perceived danger. But let me let you in on a little life lesson. You can't buy 100% safety. There's always going to be a risk. And everything is a judgment of risk versus reward. So we want to present the best possible uh, chance for safely accomplishing a task. 
but you are at a lathe spinning something that is moving at 60 plus miles an hour a lot of times, there's always going to be risk. So, before you start turning, get some eye protection. Get a mask or a dust collector or something to protect your lungs. Oh, and in editing, I forgot one thing. Uh, and for turning, this is more of a comfort issue. Wood turning, you're not really making a lot of noise. There are some steps like when you're roughing it out that there's some percussion sounds, but it's not a lot, so you don't really need a lot of hearing protection because, I mean, you look around, most wood turners don't use it. I will say a lot of the frequencies that come off of the lathe, whether it's the blade cutting through certain species of wood or just the whine of the motor, they kind of drone on me and give me a headache. So what a lot of times would happen was I used these for years. I would plug them in and then I would turn music up so loud that I could hear the music over these. So it probably wasn't the safest thing in the world because I was drowning out one sound with another, other, but muting the higher frequency sounds with this. A game changer for me, and this is a true luxury item, is these noise canceling buds that are out there nowadays. The noise canceling ones, not just the regular ones. Because not only do they take away the, the steady hum, kind of like the airplane noise of just motors running, the blades going through, but you don't you can hear music and stuff like that at a much lower volume level. So you're not kind of trying to drown out the sound, you're just kind of replacing the sound. And I like that so much better. These have been a game changer for me at the lathe. Just a little FYI. Enough about safety. Let's talk a little about basic algebra. You know, the circumference of a circle is basically pi times its diameter. So if we have a four inch circle, its circumference is approximately 12 and a half inches. Why is that important? Well, if you have a four inch blank and you're spinning it at 2000 RPMs, that is basically 25,000 inches a minute. And that's important because there are basically 63,000 inches in a mile. So we are turning almost half a mile of wood if we only have our lathe going about a half its maximum speed on a typical four inch blank. You're gonna be dulling your tools really fast when you turn. Hence, we've got to talk about buying a method of sharpening your tools. And experience, from my experience and judging from all the other professional wood turners I've ever met, it go, it's going to come down to a slow speed grinder. And what do I mean by a slow speed grinder? A normal grinder is going to spin about 3,000 RPMs. A slow speed grinder spins about 1,750 RPMs. And frankly, in my opinion, that's still way too fast. But if you get into grinders or wet wheels or something like that that turn at slower speeds, you start getting into higher and higher expenses. You can pick up a slow speed grinder at a lot of garage sales or pawn shops or something like that. Brand new, you can generally find them on sale many times a year at the woodworking stores for a hundred bucks. And when you buy them for that hundred bucks from a woodworking store, it's generally going to come with w grinding wheels that are designed for sharpening woodworking tools. You know, something that 80 or 120 grit friable wheels. Uh, that's about all you need. Uh, we don't need ultimate sharpness in turning. We just kind of, actually that serration at the cutting edge is a positive. Though a lot of us will also turn to a little honing stone, a grinding stone, a DMT stone, just to put that final hone on our edges. But that's a little bit more advanced technique. It's not something you need to worry about in a beginner course like this. Now there are a lot of different stones out there and this has been the traditional method to do it. You can buy the blue ones, the Nortons, that kind of stuff. The downside of these is they are designed to wear away, to expose fresh edges. So they're designed to break, so to speak. 
and you cannot put any sideways pressure that way, even though there are techniques where we will lightly touch it when we were shaping our gouges that I'll show you. It's not the safest thing in the world because that can cause them to explode. That's why these things have these safety gouges on them. I've just taken it off on this one to show you the wheel itself. This is the exact grinder I've used for most of my turning career. Now, when Dad uh, put his shop into storage while, they built, while we built this place right here, he let me borrow his DMT wheels. And I just haven't ever pulled the plug, taken the plunge on buying DMT wheels myself. I will say that was a mistake. They aren't that big of an investment anymore. They're probably two to three times the cost of a friable wheel, but they will last, for most of us, our lifetimes. I will tell you, Dad has been using this one for about a decade, and it is glossed over a little bit, but it still works perfectly fine. He wants to buy another one. I don't see the reason why, but when he does, these will go over to this grinder, and we will have two grinders in our shop, but you don't really need two. The advantages of these DMT wheels are kind of, kind of going to surprise you. First thing is, they don't wear down. You're constantly having to adjust your angles for your tool rest and stuff like that because these wear down and you're constantly having to dress them, reshape the faces and stuff like that. These you never do. So you can set a tool rest in one spot for a decade and never have to change it. The other thing uh, is they are a natural heat sink. Your tools, that you, as you're grinding them off, don't get as hot because the heat gets absorbed into these wheels just as much as they do in your tool. So you can actually sit here and grind on these for quite a lot longer than these right here, which you're constantly watching to make sure that they don't get too hot. Pick one of these up at a pawn shop, uh, you know, $20 to $30. If you had to put wheels on them, you're probably going to spend $20 to $30 bucks on new wheels or just buy the grinder for $100 that already comes with the wheels. Or if you go to a pawn shop and get one up, go ahead and buy a package of two of these DMT wheels. Get one that's fairly coarse and one that's fairly fine. One of them get with a little rounded over off them. Dad never uses this rounding aspect, but I do th find it nice for other woodworking tools outside of wood turning. The one negative I have with these is I don't have this flat reference over here, which again, you're not supposed to use, but there are one or two operations where I will lightly touch that. Also notice these don't have a guard on them because it's not that likely that this thing's going to explode. The other thing with grinders is the tool rest. And this is going to be one of those rare situations where I'm going to tell you just buy this model. This is the one-way Wolverine system. I believe it's about a hundred bucks right now. With it, you're going to get two of these plates down here, which you mount them so that they are even with the, the face of the wheel, one for each side. You will generally get one platform and then one bar like this. And they just slide in and you can lock them down. And what I would do a lot of times is you will see marks on the sides of mine right here. So when I'm sharpening my spindle gouge, I will slide it in there. I'll put my fingernail right there. I'll bump that up. I'll lock it down. This goes into mine exactly the same way every single time. Now some tools you'll use by dropping it down in here and you just kind of touch it and that's what sets all the angles. Other tools you might put into another accessory that you can buy. I own two of them, one for my bowl gouge, one for my spindle gouge. And basically they stop in here and your tool goes in through there and it gives you an ability to set the angles. And this is one of those things that I set it and forget it and I haven't changed it in 10 years or so. That's an accessory. These brand new, again, I, I want to say they're $100, but every wood turner ever for in the past 20 years have done this hobby seriously at all probably has this. So if you have an estate sale or something like that, you can generally pick one of them up. There are a lot of other brands out there, but one of the reasons why I like this particular setup so much oh crap is because it's solid 
most grinders come with a platform, but you can you can kind of move them all the time. They're they're flimsy. This works. It's just a lot solider system, and that solidity and repeatability of set it up is why I like it so much. Me personally, I set my platform to 40 degrees, never change it, and then this bar I have set for my spindle and bowl gouges. Again, never change it. The final two major tools that really do supplement a lathe would be either a bandsaw or a chainsaw, or both if you, if you have the capital. You know, I'm not a big fancy chainsaw, a little electric one for that size lathe is really all you need. And that just opens up the possibility of free wood. Because processing the wood to get it to the something you can do on the lathe, it's a lot easier if you have these tools. If I had a choice between the two and I was starting out in woodworking and I knew I wanted to do other things like make cabinets or other kinds of stuff, I'd definitely get a bandsaw first. If I knew I was just going to be a dedicated wood turn, that's probably all I would do because that's all the space I have in my shop, then a little electric chainsaw would probably open up a little bit more opportunities for you. But something is you go out, you get a log, you split it in half, then you bring it back to the lathe, you draw a circle on it so you can get the maximum size bowl on that lathe is great. If you don't have that ability to do a perfect circle, well, with the chainsaw, you end up kind of creating an octagon, which those little points kind of reduce the size so you can't get as big a bowl on your lathe as possible. Both allows you to maximize your work. One or the other at least opens up the opportunities. And bandsaws this size can be found on Craigslist, just dirt cheap all over the place. You, for the wood turning, you're processing it before you put it on the lathe. So precision isn't that critical. Now the final thing I'd recommend is a luxury, okay? Pure, pure luxury. You can get away with that without it. Is a little power sander. This is one that they used to sell at Harbor Freight, a little 90 degrees. It just allows you to get in and it makes sanding a little bit more enjoyable. That's the aspect of this craft I hate. And this just, because of the randomness, because you're, it's rotating and you're moving and the work is moving, it gets you better results quicker. But again, this is a luxury item, and I believe it was like $39 at Harbor Freight when we were giving them with coupons and stuff like that. They don't make this particular model out there anymore, but there's got to be something else, out, something out there like it. Now, guys, I know I've talked about spending a lot of money right off the get-go, but all this is so that you can do every single aspect of turning. Again, from spindle to flat work to bowls to ingrain hollowing, all that kind of stuff. If you just want to turn pins, well, there's no reason to get a bandsaw. There's no reason to get a chainsaw. You don't need that sanding thing. Your PPE, you don't really need a big, huge face shield. Just, you know, goggles and that kind of stuff, and you'll be just fine because you're turning something small right here. It's a kind of a specialized aspect of turning and pins, if you're doing a school fundraiser or something like that, great way to integrate uh, teens and stuff like that in the craft and earn some money, go out to fairs, that kind of stuff. I know lots of people that that's all they do and they just dive deep into it. They start doing acrylic forms, that kind of stuff. If all you want to do is make boxes, well, having a bandsaw and a chainsaw would opens up the opportunity for more material, but small boxes, you can get uh, material from uh, cabinet shops that they're throwing away. All those end cuts that have cracks in them that they can't use, a wood turner can use them. What other woodworkers throw away is our gold. And as long as you can get it in some kind of shape that's somewhat balanced, either a square or a rectangle, you can put it between centers, you can turn it. You don't need to get all that other stuff. I'm just presenting the materials that will give you the most basic set that will let you do pretty much every niche of this craft. Now that we've discussed all what we need, let's start talking about how we make messes. 
But before we do that, when we need to discuss a few theories and principles uh, and their relationship to reality, because a lot of times when we're explaining stuff, that relationship just isn't there. Now, we discussed earlier Newton's laws. Uh, to paraphrase something, in motion tends to stay in motion unless something counteracts against it. An example of that would be a bullet. You have a cannon or, or something like that, and it shoots something out. That object wants to go straight. It wants to be a vector. The downside is that we have gravity working against it, and we also have air pressing against it. It's having to push out it. That's why projectiles start out really fast with a slight curve, and then as the air slows it down, the curve comes down farther and farther and farther because gravity is working on it at a consistent rate, so the forward progression, all that kind of stuff. Bullets and cannons and all that kind of stuff travel in a arc. Well, if you have something spinning, in reality, it's wanting to travel in a vector. What keeps it from launching pieces out is the adhesion of the molecules binding it down this way. Okay? But in talking about turning, we have to talk about vectors. For example, if you were to touch a turning piece of wood right at that point right there, well, it's coming around. The vector itself is going straight down. Why is that important? Well, if we were to put our tool rest right here, and then our tool happened to touch that tool, the wood at that point, well, the force acting on the tool is wanting to push this tool straight down. So we have a little leverage advantage holding the tool handle way back here to counteract the one horsepower and the speed of the diameter of our tool blank that is trying to shove our tool straight down. Now I want you to imagine if you were to touch that tool right here, where is the vector of power now going? Boom, straight back at you. So now you do not have, if you put the tool rest right here so you touch it, the tool rest is not handling any of the power. The power is not being transferred through the tool rest, through the lathe, through your stand, into the ground. Now it is strictly your bicep and tricep, shoulder muscles that are trying to hold a horse back. It ain't going to happen. But that is the theory as we talk about stuff. In reality, there are some nuances to the situation. In that, if you were to only ever touch your tools at that mid-range so that all your power is using your, your gravity's your body weight and gravity to hold that back of that handle down because the front is trying to lift it up so that's where you're counterbalancing the long lever with the tool rest. Well, you have no forward control. Control a lot of times is a, a balance of resistance. You know, you're kind of pushing against something a little bit to control it. So, on some tools, we want all the power coming back up. But on some tools, we want a little resistance coming back to us so we can counteract it with a little bit of control. So our tool rest placement on some tools is going to be at a location where we can touch in the middle. On other tools, we might raise it up going against the kind of common sense of the power transfer simply so that we can have a lot of power transfer coming down this way and a little bit coming back for back against us so we can resist it and gain control. Now, this is different from every single tool. 
And those of y'all that are watching my videos and say like that and say, oh, I'm going to be using carbide all the time. I watch other YouTubers, they make it look so simple. Well, that's kind of a litmus test. Watch those people working. Because a lot of times what I see is if you watch that four cuts video, you understand that a carbide tool is a scraper. So a, car a scraper works at a negative angle. So you want to touch the wood so that the ang a positive angle would be like this, a negative angle would be like that. So in reality, when you touch the wood, if you're touching it right at that midpoint right there, your handle is going, should be coming down ever so slightly so you have that negative angle. But they teach people to put the tool level and push in. Well, that is entirely possible if you were to lower the tool rest and have the contact point slightly below the center line. That way, the angle coming off the tool creates that negative tool angle. That's how a scraper will properly work. And when you're touching slightly below that center line, we're talking just a little bit, not that much. But when you explain it to people, you tell them, you know, keep it flat, move it towards the center. But what you see quite often is somebody will put that tool rest right at the center line and think, oh, we are now going to engage at the center line. But then they have a tool that has a massive bar to it, and then that little cutter head comes off over here, and where do they end up touching? Way up top. And where is the force coming when they touch? Some of it's going down, but some of it is coming right back at them. So you watch their hands, they're duh, 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 and they think they're making a smooth cut. I've even seen some where they get it so high that the wood's actually touching the bar, and they wonder why it's not cutting. It's because the cutting edge can't reach the wood at the angle they are presenting it. And that right there is not a scraping cut at all. Wonder why they get, have to do so much sanding. Now the tool we are going to start out using in this series is a spindle roughing gouge. Now the industry for the past decade or so has been really trying to get people to call this a spindle roughing gouge in order to really drive home that this is for spindle turning only. Basically only for if you're turning a tree on its side working this way, this tool is meant to work across that grain like that. If you start working it this way or this way, which interacts a lot with end grain with a lot more resistance, there's a good chance that this thing will snap in half, fly back at you, go through your neck, and spray your wall with a Tarantino level of splatter. So we just don't want to do use this tool for anything other than spindles. And the weakness of this tool is in this shank because how they make this tool is they take a flat piece of metal and they basically roll it around on a press and then just stick that flat piece, the part that's still flat into the handle as a shank as opposed to something like a bowl or a spindle gouge which is a solid bar. Now why is that weak? Well if you've ever taken a, a, a can you know, you flatten it, and then you can bend it back and forth, and it will snap in half. But if you're bending it before you flatten it, it just it's a lot more resistant. So this is that tin can in the flat portion, and because you've got it curved here, and the rest is in the handle, all the torque happens right there, and just repeatedly using it, it will bend on you, weaken on you, and eventually break. But... If you're just using it very easily, going across a grain, as it's designed for, there is so little stress, this will last you a lifetime. It is also one of those tools that you don't have to have ultimately sharp. It's not leaving a finished ready surface. It's just getting rid of the harder, harder angles. Its main purpose is turning square stuff or a round branch or log or something like that and getting rid of all the bark 
to get to a point where everything's smooth and balanced so that your other tools that have finer fin that will leave a finer finish can come into it. It's also something that I use a lot for bulk removal, even if it is perfectly round, because this thing is so easy to sharpen. Now the spindle roughing gouge is basically sharpened straight across. So you don't have any root angles on the nose as you do your other tools. And this angle right here, I do mine at 40 degrees for the simple reason I have a lot of tools that use that 40 degree angle. So I freehand sharpen a lot of this stuff. So if I can set a platform up at 40 degrees, all I have to do is come over here and go burp, burp like that. But if you're using the Wolverine jig, what they actually do teach is you can set your gown, your this bar up with a little tail tail piece right there into it, and you'll notice that I have a little mark right here on my bar. So I will stick my fingernail on that one, progress it up, and I can come back to the same setting time and time again. So now all I do is I put the handle in here, and I just go burp burp, and that will give you a fairly consistent setting. The problem is, if you're doing this a whole bunch, which, again, you don't have to sharpen this tool a little bit, that angle is going to slowly get steeper and steeper and steeper as you wear away material. So occasionally, you have to reset it. And how do you reset it? Well, remember me telling you that this angle isn't critical? What I would do is I would just move it forward a little bit, mark a little line. And if you ever want to check that angle, you just put a protractor right down the center right there, and come down here and if you're around 40 degrees you're going to be fine but that isn't as accurate as if I could just have a platform that is always at 40 degrees I have one that I like to just leave in here where I never change this angle it's always set at 40 degrees and I have some other layout lines for other tools on it simple sharpie marker if I ever have to change those all I can do is put a little alcohol on it, wipe it off, and do the Sharpies again. And I also have a little line right here. I put it forward with my fingernail, stop it, and hide it dead set. But how do you get this angle in the very first time? Well, once again, you can sharpen a tool, check that angle here with a protractor, and then just kind of trial and error until you get it dead perfect. Otherwise, there are a bunch of different accessories, kind of like this Raptor right here, where if your angles are all off, okay, it has a flat, you basically put that on there, drop it down, bring it up, and when both of these points touch, you have your tool set up. So lock it down here, lock it here, make your Sharpie line, and don't change this one. And that's one of the things I like about this Wolverine is it is sturdy enough. That setting is going to stay for quite a long while. Um, you can't say that to the other ones. FYI, if you ever have to micro adjust that, you can just kind of tap it here or here because the pivot point is in the middle. That's your micro adjustment on these little ledges. From here, all I will do, I'll come over here, I'll put my fingers in the thing to really keep it flat. That's the key thing is I want it flat, and I'll start on one side and just rotate it around. My key thing is I want to keep this level. I don't want the, the, these two pieces to go lean forward, and I don't want them to lean back. I just want it level, so this is what it looks like. Let it ramp up. Then get back to work, because I've got a nice fresh edge all the way around, a little burr right here, and I really do not have to do that very often on this tool. Now, through all my woodworking career, I've always been kind of cheap, and I've always used a protracted method, meaning I would sharpen something, and if I needed to check the angle, I would just stick it right here and then just use a protractor and figure it out. Not overly difficult, but there's a bit of trial and error. These things right here are dads, but he also has another one made by Stuart, ba designed by Stuart Batty, a fairly famous whip turner. 
that he likes to use. I'll let him show you how it works. This is the Stuart Batty gauge, and it, it allows you to measure anywhere from 20 to 70 degrees. And you basically set it down flat and bring it up to the wheel. And this one is already set for 40, Sean just set it for 40 degrees, and you can see it's already set for 40 degrees. But you've got a slight curve right, right here, and you want, when it's set down, you want both, you want it to, to match up with your wheel. And you can see right there, it matches up with the wheel. Whereas if you came over here to say 20 degrees, you can see it's not matching up to, up to the wheel here. Something close to that would be 50. Here you can see it, there's 50, but you can see it's not quite matching up. But if you go over here to 40, it matches up. And you just adjust that angle to where you're at it. So I really like this one. Now if you are cheap like me, once you got it dialed in, if you want to repeat it over and over and over, just take a piece of, you know, thin plywood or something like that and grind it right here. Just brrr like that and it will have that curve for you that you can use at any time to get back to the, that one particular setting. So that's not only how you sharpen the tool, but how you get that angle. In, in this case 40 degrees. Now there is a, a term or a phrase that we use all the time in wood turning it's called riding the bevel. This being the bevel. The idea of turning is you have your tool rest right here. You will touch your tool to your tool rest and then you're going to drop the tool down until the bevel touches the work. Notice the cutting edge is way high right now and then you will keeping contact with both the tool rest and the wood, you'll draw back until the bevel and the cutting edges is engaged. And these two pivot points are what give you your contact because once the blade engages the wood, just the nature of cutting, it wants to dive into the wood. But the bevel is pushing back out and that's what gives you balance. But that is a theoretical explanation of what is happening that's easy to understand but in reality, something slightly different is happening. Because we basically sharpened it on an eight inch wheel, which means that the bevel of our gouge is now has a slight eight inch curve right there. Well, if you have an eight inch curve on a tool and you are wanting to turn something that has a much smaller radius such as a normal four incher or something like an inch and a half well obviously whenever the cutting edge is touching the wood the bevel is going to be in the air so what we're actually talking about when you say that is a sensation you ride you touch that bevel down you pull it back until you see shavings coming across and it actually feels like you're pivoting off that bevel but when it, in actuality what's happening is you have your blank, say this is an inch and a half, and then you have your gouge coming off, and it has an eight inch curve right there, and there's the cutting edge. Well, you're actually riding the bevel that is just, you know, a little bit behind the cutting edge the actual bevel is going to be sitting in the air. So you're going to have, it's an easy way to explain the sensation of what's going on, but there's always going to be somebody out on the internet that says riding the bevel is physically impossible. That's what they're talking about. Don't let that real world occurrence take away from the theoretical explanation because the sensation will go along with the theory. Now here's another thing. We have a 40 degree bevel. So this line right here is now going to be the bottom of that flute. That's all that we're worried about. That's what's going to be doing the work. So real quickly, just for explanation points, I'm gonna erase the wings, okay? So we are wanting to engage the wood at the midpoint so that all the power is being transferred down. Okay, 
This is one of those situations where you want that to come all the way down. You don't want any pressure coming back because in this situation, we are taking off these corners. So a lot of times you're spinning, you're turning air and then it hits a corner. Air hits a corner. Well, if you have any need to put forward pressure in there, what will happen is the tool will actually go, when it's turning air, it's going to move forward and then it's going to take too big a chunk. And then even more power is going to be transferred down into your arm. And then it's going to go in the air. And then you'll be even deeper. And it'll take a bigger mic the next time. And it's just a lot more aggressive if you're pushing forward with the tool into that. So in this situation, we really do want to engage where most all the power is going straight down so that we are less inclined for pushing forward. That's a unique aspect of this tool. But if we want to engage at that midpoint, we cannot have the tool coming straight out. We actually have to angle our tool down so that that bevel will ride slightly so the wood will actually touch right there and prevent the blade from diving into too deeply into the wood. So we actually have to drop the back of our handle enough so that that bevel is practically straight up and down as we touch it to that wood. That dictates where our tool rest is going to be. So right now my tool rest is the proper distance from my work. And notice I can spin it around and there's a slight air gap over it. When you're spinning bigger stuff, as you knock away the corners, you'll have to bring the tool rest closer and closer in. If I was way out here, when I was turning, all of a sudden, all my leverage advantage has gone away. Now it's quite a bit. So each, each rotation as it hits this is transferring more of that one horsepower to the tool. The closer I get, the more leverage I have, the less it's going to uh, be impacting my hand as I work it over and I will maintain more control. But if you notice right now, my tool rest is right about the midway point. But if I hold the, the tool at the angle where the bevel is, look at where I'm touching on the tool. Way up high. No good, no good. So I actually have to lower the tool rest with this tool. Whoops, wrong handle. Until I can get both the angle and where it's touching on the wood either right at center or just a little bit above is okay. And at that point in time, I get most of the control. The power is going down through here and not coming back at here. So I'm less likely to push forward into the cut whenever I am turning. Now, when I get all these angles lined up just perfectly to make the cut, I want you all to look at my body position. It is quite obvious that this lathe on this workbench is way too hot. Yes, I'm building a, a lathe stand for me right now, so we can get that other. That'll be a separate video from the series. But the idea is your placement of your lathe should be probably right around where your elbow is. If you're going to be doing a lot of micro turning where you want to be able to see a little bit better, you know, raise it up a little above the above your elbow. But other than that, keep it by your elbow because at the elbow level, all of a sudden, notice my hand position, my angles right here. I'm not, I'm not tight up here to make that angle. It's all down by my hip, it's all low. So for that one reason only, I'm going to actually do this experiment on my one way, but it shouldn't affect anything else. And the rest of the series I would do on this lathe because I will have the proper stand and I will have my lathe set up at the proper height so that I'm not bunched up uh, and I'll have more control. And I'm going to do this example using a chuck with no tailstock simply so I can get the camera angle so I want so y'all can see this. We'll go back to the jet in a second. So what I've done is I've set my tool rest up so that at roughly that 40 degree angle to get this most of the way to parallel I am able to put it right on my hip. 
make it nice and easy for me to control it. Because once I find the right cutting angle, put it against your body, and now we're just going to move our bodies back and forth. It's much easier to get big control moving a larger section than to just using your fingers for that control, especially when you're fighting a, a horsepower motor. So when we say riding the bevel, I've got the lathe turned on. Because it's spinning so fast, it begins to act like a solid piece of wood. I touch the tool to the tool rest. Notice how extreme the angle is. I touch the bevel to the wood. You hear it? I lift up, making sure one part of my hand is touching the tool rest. Until I see shaving. Once you start seeing shaving, you can just move your body. surface finish. Even with this rough tool that's actually making little U-cuts, it's not making a straight cut, that is gorgeous. But if I were to have engaged it straight, flat like that, which is mainly a scraping cut because it's not taking into account that bevel angle, so I, I need to move my tool. Well, let's try it. I need to move this back a little bit to make that kind of cut. I'll move that back. Watch what happens. I come back over. I've got my tool flat. I'm just going to engage it flat. We have much harder control. It's wanting to jump on me. But also, now look at the finish. Much. Oh, you can feel the difference. That's really smooth. And right there, can you start seeing all that tear out, all that roughness? And this is hard maple, it's not going to be that extreme, but it is quite a bit different. That one has a little bit of translucent sheen, that's dull. But I hope you saw in that example that as I explained it, I was telling you, tool rest, bevel, edge, that was the sensation I was feeling. But as I was cutting with the angle you saw, you actually saw that the bevel was in the air and it was really just gliding along right behind the edge on the wood. That was a part of the bevel that was giving you your depth control so this tool just didn't dive deep into the wood. Now the spindle roughing gouge, because of the way the blade is shaped straight across, which makes it really easy to sharpen, is pretty much always presented to the wood perpendicular to it. Very rarely would you ever cant the handle to the side one way or the other. Now, if we were to sit here all the time and just, just uh, turn right here, this center section would get dull qu fairly quickly. That's one of the cool things about this tool and why you can use it for a long time between sharpenings is because the wood doesn't know the difference between it being here, 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 here. You're rotating it around like that because at every single point along there, it's at 40 degrees. If you're using the part of the blade that is supported in the cut, and here's what I mean by that. Now, those of y'all that did your homework, this is going to be a review. But, you know, we present the, we touch the tool to the tool rest, and then we touch the blade, the bevel, and then the blade to the wood. Notice if I'm cutting right here on the blade, what is right below that portion? That's where the tool, the round bottom of the tool, is on the tool rest. So I can actually press down as hard as I want right here, and that tool is very stable. It's not going to rotate any. 
but if I come over here and press down on a part of the blade that is not touching on the tool rest, what's the tool want to do? It wants to rotate around until it gets to a point where I am pressing down right where it is touching on the tool. And so you never really want to touch the a cutting edge to wood inducing downward force from the rotation of the, of the blank unless that portion of the blade is directly above the contact point of your tool on the tool rest. Anywhere else will induce the tool just ripping out of your hand and going somewhat out of control. But this and this, as long as I'm touching right here, still engages 40 degrees. So the wood doesn't know if it is being cut on this portion of the blade, that portion of the blade, or anywhere in between. But I want you to notice what would happen if I were to turn this blade sideways and then the farthest point out would be touching right here. And guess what? That is not a supported portion of the blade. That is a why a lot of tools, they curve from here backwards because they are designed so that you can move the handle around and keep the edge engaged with the supported part of the tool. Now, we covered all that stuff because I now know that when you go out to the workshop and you turn on your lathe for the first time, you're probably going to be taking some kind of square stock and making it round. And that's what this tool is used for. And you will be now be able to approach a situation not only knowing how the tool is made, its strengths, its weaknesses, but why you use the tool a certain way. Why you engage the wood at a certain spot. Why you put the tool rest at a certain height. Why you stand a certain way and press what parts you are touching. The hand is on the tool. The hand is touching the tool rest for depth control. It is on your body so that you can, can make nice, smooth, controlled movements with the largest muscles in your body. Okay? you now should have the confidence to try it and do it successfully. So we are going to do some projects today, but these projects are, re going, to, are going to require a second turning tool, and that is probably going to be another one of the cheapest tools you will buy, a parting tool. And once again, this is going to be one of the cheapest tools you will get, mainly because it's so easy to make. It is basically just a square rectangular piece of high-speed steel that you grind an angle on. I personally use 40 degrees, so it's 40 degrees here and 40 degrees here simply because that's how I set up my grinder. I have that one platform that's always at that 40 degrees, so it's nice and easy. And this is a tool that I sharpen quite a bit, but I don't, for some reason, I don't ever tend to wear it down that often because it takes a lot of abuse. I can use it as a parting tool doing peeling cuts. I can use it as a uh, on its side to create a nice V gouge. It is a scraping cut there and I can even tilt it down and use the angle if I tilt, I actually t drop the handle and turn this top wing into a negative rake scraper which we'll get into that technique later on in here. But real quickly let me show you how I sharpen it. So I'll come over to the grinder, I'll turn it on, I'll let it speed up. Put the tool on the tool rest, put pressure on top to make sure it's down, make sure it's parallel with there, and here we go. My tool is now sharp. That's simple. Now in this project, we're going to use this tool in a peeling cut. For those of y'all that didn't pay attention in the four cuts video, which was your homework, we are basically going to peel away the fibers as we come down. 
Now we want to position the tool rest somewhat at the mid zone, but we're actually going to be touching a little bit above center, maybe three fourths of the way up. And then as we move, we're going to arc our way down. The reason why we arc our way down is because the diameter, uh, excuse me, the, yeah, the diameter is going to shrink as we come down and we're going to want to continue to ride that bevel slightly behind the cutting edge. We'll start out touching here, lift it up until we see shavings and that will keep that bevel riding. So here we go. I turn it on, turn up the speed a little bit and in this action I start, I touch, I lift up until I see shavings coming off, then I push forward and kind of arc my way down towards the center. Notice if I go too far forward, it stops cutting, so then I can come back a little bit and arc my way down towards the center. Easy peasy. Nothing stressful about that. Now, I did that on the end, holding it in a chuck, just so that you could see what we're doing. But I'm going to set this, this lathe up between centers, which is pretty much how it will come from the factory, and in case you haven't gotten your chuck in yet. So the, both of these projects and exercises we're going to be doing between centers, which means I have that live center, I mean that drive center, that goes into the headstock, and we have the free spinning live center on back. And I just went back and picked up a piece of, I think this is uh, cedar elm, might be pecan, I'm not 100% sure. But this was a piece of firewood that I just painted the ends after I squared it off on the bandsaw. And you got a little 10 inch bandsaw, you got a piece of firewood, cut out the pith, square it up, paint the ends, let it dry. Free, free wood to make something. So first thing is I like to find the center and notice there's nothing square about my cuts. They were straight off a bandsaw. So what I would do is I would take my awl Put my thumb on one corner and use that as a pivot point, pointing over there and just draw straight back until I can eyeball that's centered in between the other two corners. And that's close enough for centering for me for turning. To repeat, thumb on a corner, that's a pivot point. I put there, just draw it straight back until I can then eyeball it lined up between these other two points. And then then pick which side will go to the head and the tail. Me personally, I generally like the flatter side to go to the tail when I'm using this cup drive because it has that circle that is kind of parallel. Where there's a drive side, don't really worry about that one because those teeth will bite in no matter what. So then we just line everything up, put the little center parts in the holes you just created, tighten up your tail stock, and then tighten this up until the, the cup drive is pressing really hard and you've got the teeth embedded over here. At which point, spin it, make sure everything's looking okay, and then you can position your tool rest. This is one of those advantages of having, you know, a, you know I think it comes with a six inch tool rest and getting one long one, because you use the long ones in spindle turning quite a bit. And rotate it around to make sure it is close but won't touch and give yourself you know a half of an inch a gap right there make sure the speed is turned all the way down and turn it on turn it off and I've, I forgot to set the tool rest height to where I wanted but it was set for my pre previous experiment so that at the proper angle I know I'm going to be engaging roughly right above center just a tad bit. So, turn it on. We can increase the speed standing to the side while you increase the speed just in case. That right there is right, right around 1500 RPMs. I'm comfortable with that. If you aren't comfortable with that, no reason why you can't turn it slower. It's not that big a deal. I just find if I'm turning a little bit quicker, because it's engaging the wood more often per second, it just feels a little bit smoother. So I touch a tool rest down, 
I like to do my two corners first. So I'll come over here, touch the tool rest down, lift up until I see shavings. Notice my palm is on the tool rest behind everything. And then I'll just move over to the side. Touch, lift, move. Touch, lift, move. Touch, lift, move. Now I'll come over here, do the same thing. Touch, lift, move. Then in the center, and now lock it to my hip, and then just move myself across. Another angle to show you the steps. Tool wrist, wood, lift up until I see shavings. Move the body. And if you want to put the tool on the tool, you can see whenever you're smooth, it won't bounce. If it's not smooth, it starts to bounce. So look at what we're at. Pretty good. Smooth over there. I still got flats on this side. So just keep working it until you get so you think it will fit inside a honey jar. Because the very first project we're doing is making a honey dipper. So just have fun wasting away material. Though you might need to reset your tool rest to get it a little bit closer after you've worn away those corners. Oh, and never work onto the corners. Always work off because you'll get a little catchy right there. Forgot to tell you that. Now we've got it pretty round right now, but you'll notice it is pretty trashed. I mean, this is a very rough cutting tool. So I want you to do one thing. We've been working it like this. This time I want you to do a very light cut, but turn your tool a little bit over so that flat is going to be cutting and go slow. And let's see how good a finish you can get right off that tool. So we've got this ugly piece of wood and until now, I've been taking my tool, touching it to the tool rest, lifting up, and just going that center section, and going back and forth really fastly. Now, I'm going to do the same exact thing, except I'm going to turn my tool over onto that side, which the wood won't know the difference, but, this t but it is engaging a little bit more of the, of the edge, whereas that right there is just doing that small little U. And watch the difference, because we can actually get a pretty nice cut. We just go nice and slow. And go all the way across. Still keeping the tool perpendicular to the tool rest and the blank. And just working my way across nice and slow. I'll do it once back and once more across. And we can look at the results. But can you tell the difference in the shavings? And the feel and the sound, all that kind of stuff. Let's see what we got now. Pretty smooth. Probably won't need to do much sanding on that one, will we? Now what I want to do is make a little thinner portion right here that can be the handle. So what we're going to do is use the same techniques, except we're just going to go back and forth. But the thing is, if you're removing more material, we're going to create a little ledge on this side. So what you want to do is kind of go back and forth, but each time you come over, don't go quite as far coming over. And what you don't want to do is touch that unsupported portion of the blade to wood. So that little ledge right there, as we create a little slant in our wood, like that, we don't want that to touch it because it will want to spin down. So I'm going to start where I want to start it, work my way across, and just do a little bit at a time until I get it to a thickness that's a nice handle.
But notice I don't come all the way over each time. Now that we got that taper there, what I can do is I can start at the top and kind of work my way down. I'm not ever going to work my way up, I'm always going to be working towards the center. And that goes back to that prerequisite course information about working with the grain. Going down towards the center, you're always laying fibers down. So here we go. Start at the top. Work my way down. Start at the top, work my way down. Start at the top, work my way down. Start at the top, work my way down. Top, work my way down. And what do we do? We have a fairly nice finish for a handle right there. So now all we got to work is on the head of the honey dipper and create some grooves. For that, I turn to the parting tool. So I'm going to do a little bit of the back of the handle, a little bit of the front of the handle, and then I'm going to come back to the back. You always want to work the tailstock first because the power is coming from here. So if I make it really thin on this side, well, the power could actually torque and twist those fibers out and then they would break off. But if I make it a little bit thin over here, well, the power is still coming over there. So we don't have to worry about it over here. So, just like in the example, I'm going to start high, come down till the shavings come off, and then kind of arc my way in. But notice I don't go very deep. Now I'm going to move over a little bit, so I'm only going to use half of that gouge and do the same th exact thing. And notice how much easier it is. And then when I take the full amount, I only go in maybe an eighth of an inch. Then I can take the other half, come down until I'm engaging the full thing go in a little bit, move over, come down, go in a little bit, move over, come down, go in a little bit. Fairly simple. Now if you want to do something a little advanced, you can put a little bevel right there. Notice how this top edge is now at a negative angle. We discussed that earlier. I'm just going to lightly touch that corner and we're going to scrape it. Voila, we have now created our end stock and a bevel. There might be some tear out on that face because this is a peeling cut, but we're just practicing. Now let's go to the other end. So what I'm wanting to do is create some grooves along here for the honey to get into, and then maybe chop it off right here uh, so that we have just a little he head right there. Now there are a couple ways you can do the grooves. You could do exactly what we did on the other side and just make pretty wide grooves here. If you wanted to, you could use the other parting tool, which we sharpen the same exact way, just touching at that 40 degrees and make thinner gouges. I'm going to use this, this one right here just for the sake of it. Or if you wanted to, you could use this tool as a scraper and actually come up, lift up the back of the handle. So it is negative, see, negative, and then just make little indentations using that corner right there. Maybe I'll try that for you. So I come over, few indentations. like that. Now 
we're going to take a little bit, move over using half the tool, go do a little bit deeper, move over a little bit deeper, move over a little bit deeper. Before we get too far, we will add that little bevel using that negative scraping action. And then we will go a little bit deeper. Just like that. Now this first one may take you five minutes because think about what we did. I use an awl to create the centers. I mounted it between centers. I made it round. I cut out a little bit more with a handle. I smoothed this end. I blended that in. I cut that one down. Made some indentations and cut that one down. Second one might take you four minutes and I guarantee you can get this project down to less than a minute and not feel stressed doing it. So you could batch out 20 of these and take them out to a farmer's market or something like that, put them in a basket, there's something to sell. You teach a kid to do this one, they can sell them at school as fundraisers to all their teachers would just love a little honey dipper or something. Uh, but go from there. This was a, as simple as a design as I could make it. Now you could sand this, but really off the blade it's pretty smooth. Um, I'm not going to. Uh, but uh, we are going to take it off. So what I will typically do when I'm teaching people is we left it really thick. Uh, the ends really, really thick. Normally I would take them down to toothpick size just to, to show off, I guess, because you don't really need to. But we can take it out of the lathe and then using our flush cutting saw, just saw it off. One two, and you have a little stub you can sand. One, two, and I have a little stub I can sand off, and there's my little honey dipper. Put a little oil on it, you're all set. How about we make a handle real quickly using the same exact techniques, just a little bit bigger scale. So I have a piece of boat art. I've already found the centers with my scratch hole. We're going to get it mounted. Now I'm just going to make a very simple design just like I did with that honey dipper. But if you're looking for my more advanced mallet designs, want to make one yourself, I have several videos on making mallets on my channel. You just might have to search for it and there are quite a few of them out there because I used to sell these ones that are ergonomically designed. They have a recess here so you can use and tap stuff lightly. They're designed to be held this way and that way. So there's three different ways you can hold these handles and the angles are all set. The anchor point, the humps are all set to work with your hands so you don't have to hold it to use it. So you can use it all day without developing carpal tunnel or getting sore or anything like that. There's a lot of engineering going into a good quality mallet, but we're just going to make something that works today. So we've got a mallet between centers. Let's just make it round. A mallet is going to be too big for my tool rest. So just like we did with that honey dipper, I'm only going to be able to work on one side, which means I will start rounding it. But each time I do it, I will go a little bit less. I'm going to move over here and do this one until I get down to that level and then progress it down a little bit more and then move it back over until I get it completely round. The, that's what's that technique of not going all the way over each time allows you to do is round out a lot longer stuff than your tool rest is long. Ten, stand by the side when you turn it on the first time, turn the speed down. Slowly bring it up in case anything gets thrown off. Oh, my lathe is rattling. That's way too fast. So turn the speed down until it's not moving around. I am right around 400 RPMs. Now, now that I'm at that speed, I want you to hear the difference between how smooth it was rounding out that square for the honey dipper than this square is for the mallet.
because this is moving so much slower, I have to move slower with my tool. Now I want you to notice where the tool rest is and where my cutting edge is engaging in relation to the position on the circle. Is that the dead center or am I gauging too high? And what about my tool's reaction tells you I'm engaging in the right spot or the wrong spot? Can you see how I'm going back and forth like that? It kind of tells you I'm having to put pressure on the back of the handle, right? So what would happen if I engaged a little bit lower? So let's lower my tool rest a tad bit. Make it a little bit tighter because it was shifting a little bit. And now see what happens. I come back on, turn it on, it speeds up. And now I'm going to be engaging more evenly. Notice how much easier it is for me to control. Notice that this hand is not going back and forth that much. Now I'm not engaging right at center. I'm still quite a bit of ways above, but the closer to the center I got, the easier it was for me to control. The closer the round you get, the faster you can turn it up, the speed up. The faster you turn the speed up, the smoother the cuts are going to be. And but when I say smoother, I mean smoother on you. Not we're not talking about the wood here. Once you've got it round, it's time to. I got a little bit of crack here, but it's just a turning now, so no big deal. Uh, it's time to figure out which side is going to be the handle. Crack starts right here, so I'll try and work my way past and make this the handle. And we're going to do it the same exact way we did the honey dipper. I'm going to start here. I'm going to work with my material. I'm going to work my way back until I get to the depth I want. And then I'm going to start from the top. Work my way to the center, maybe make some kind of decoration over here. It's easy. Then start high, work my way down. Touch, touch, lift, move. Touch, touch, lift, move. And then on the last time you go through, just go real slow. About the bottom of the curve, so I'll start back over here and come back this way. Turn it off and let's take a look at what we got. Pretty smooth handle. I'm not going to sand this, but if you wanted to, I mean, it's just a mallet. And we got a head. I've still got the little crack, but who cares? So now let's look at work on the two ends like we did with the uh, honey dipper. I'm going to start high, work my way down, go in maybe an eighth inch, come over half the width of the blade, and progress.
Notice I am putting quite a bit of pressure down when I'm doing this. It just kind of stabilizes the cut. Come over using the negative rake. Put my little bevel on. Do the same thing over here. And there we go. You know, it's not the greatest mallet in the world, but five minutes worth of work, and you have something that you can discipline your boss with. Now, we've covered a whole lot in this video, but that's really kind of how classes work. We had to build up. And we are translating a lot of stuff from the prerequisite course to this one. So we still have to build the base knowledge that we're talking with. But at the end, the end, we've learned two really important tools in why they work a certain way they did. And in the next classes, we don't have to spend as much on the theory and stuff like that. We can base on this one and we can get more and more advanced the farther along the semester goes with better and better projects because frankly a, a honey dipper and a mallet aren't the most exciting things in the world. But just as a little incentive, next Tuesday after this thing goes live, I'm going to have a Q&A session answering questions from this video and the first class video. And if you don't, aren't able to make that live session, I will archive it in the description of this one. There will be links in there. There will also be a bunch of links that some of them will be associate links, some of them won't, just depending upon what's available of all the tools I use in here and variations of that. But as a reward for coming to the Q&A, we'll give away this mallet in that Q&A. Straight off the tool, nothing special, a little crack in here, but it's something you can use for a little while until you get going. It'll service needs for banging stuff. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed this. You learned a few things. Remember, it's always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. So get out in the shop, make stuff that you can give to your friend, and be safe and have fun.